Well, good morning, friends. How are we doing? All right. We're so glad you're here. If you're willing and able, would you stand with us? We've been starting the services off with this one song, remembering that the Lord's only been faithful to us. Let's sing. You're more than a story or a song I've heard. You're righteous in glory, good for your word. You're loving and patient. You've always been kind. You brought me back to life. I don't know how you always do. You never change, you're always moving. And great is your faithfulness. And great is your faithfulness. I don't know how. Y'all can have a seat. 
Well, good morning, Providence. Great is his faithfulness in every season. We are so glad that you're here this morning. My name is Ben. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Providence, and I just want to say welcome, whether you're in this room, uh, you're in prisms, or you're joining us online. We're so glad you're here. We'd love to meet you, uh, to get to know you, uh, and to start a conversation with you. And so you can take that blue card that's on the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. And then after the service, you can stop by the welcome desk where we have people that would love uh, to greet you and get to know you. So we are really glad you're here. If you prefer a digital version or you're joining us online, you can go to pray.org slash info and find that there. That is also the best place for you to uh, access all the different opportunities that we have here at Providence. And one of the things you'll find there is that coming up on Mother's Day, about a month from now, is going to be our next child dedication. Now here at Providence, we love families and we love the younger generation. We want to see our kids uh, come to know God and to live lives where they love and they worship Jesus. And we believe that the best opportunity for that to happen is when the church and the home are in partnership together, working together. We want the church to be able to love and to encourage and to be able to lift up our parents and our families. And child dedication is kind of the start of that journey. Uh, That's an opportunity for parents of little ones to be able to stand up here and to dedicate their children to the Lord and the purposes that he has for them, uh, for them to commit themselves to lead their children spiritually, but also for us as a church to say, we commit to lock arms with you, to love you, encourage you, to lift you up, to resource you, and to help you to raise these kids to know, love, and worship Jesus. And so if you have a little one here at Providence, we would love to invite you to be a part of that child dedication service uh, on May 12th. Well, we're in the middle of a series uh, going through the Gospel of Mark. And time and time again, we see Jesus bringing and welcoming the crowds to himself. And the beautiful reality and truth is that he is welcoming and pulling us in towards himself as well. And he is the one that provides all of the strength and everything we need in every season. And so in light of that, I'm going to ask, would you stand back up and let's continue to worship Jesus together this morning. We're glad you're here.
is true that there isn't a single need that you have this morning that Christ himself isn't ready to answer. And I don't mean just a situational need. I mean, the, the, the real need that we have is the presence of Jesus, that we would see him, that we would look at him and worship him. And he stands this morning, friends, ready, ready for your burden. Could we lay it down at his feet this morning as we sing? We
Jesus, we love you. Jesus, you're worthy. Thank you for loving us. The most unlovable. The ones that would turn their backs on you. The ones that would fail time and time again. Lord, we are the people that you're calling. <laughs> Not perfect people, but needy people. So Lord, show us that you, that you've come for the needy. You've come for the broken. Not so that the world would see our power or our greatness, but that the world would see your power and your greatness your love, your justice, your mercy. Lord, would that propel us to sing and worship, to live lives surrendered to you, we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hey, good morning. I'm Dan. We're so glad you're here. We know that Providence is big and we know you can easily feel lost. There's something really special about feeling known and growing with others. And we see that happen in small group communities that we at Providence call life groups. If you want to learn what life groups are all about and other growing opportunities that we have, join us next week for the Grow Step, the Providence Pathway. Things will kick off next week at 11. See you then. Well, Providence family, it's so good to see you. Uh, those of you who are in this space or various others, we're glad that you've joined us. If you're a guest with us, we're really glad that you are here. I pray this time is going to be encouraging to you. If you have a Bible in your hand, turn with me to Mark chapter 3. If you don't, there's lots of Bibles in the chairs near you. If you don't have your own Bible, we'd love for you to take that home as a gift. If you are new, we're walking through Mark. It's one of the four books that speak about the life of Jesus while he was on the earth, that sort of detail his story. And we're going verse by verse through Mark, and we're up to chapter 3, verse 7. And this message um, is called, Called from the Crowd. We all know what a crowd is. You happen to be in one. We're all in one, right? That's where there's a lot of people. What we don't quite understand is the word called, because it's used in a variety of different ways. Like you've probably heard someone say, I'm called to be a pastor. I'm called to go overseas as a missionary. But you've also heard someone say, I'm called to break up with you. And so when you have the <laughs> divergence of use of the word calling, what you find is there's a lot of confusion. And one of the reasons is simply because of how it's used. Some people actually hijack what the Bible uses as a word called calling, in order to add credibility to a decision that they believe that they need to make, and you, when you add calling to it, it makes it to where it's irrefutable. Well, well, if you got a word from God, I really can't say anything about that. But what's interesting is when you hear calling in such diverse ways, maybe when you open up the Bible or you hear someone say, man, I feel called to go overseas, or I feel called to repent of the sin, or I feel called to serve in this way, it produces a skepticism in us that it's really good to know what a calling is. A calling, we used to have phones that we would talk to people on them and, and we would call each other. We would dial a number and they'd say, hey, I have something I want to ask you or something I want to tell you. I have a word for you. A calling is that. It's a word, a message that we receive from God when we're typically in a crowd. But what's interesting is not everyone hears it. It comes to you by the power of the Holy Spirit through his word. He speaks to you, and when you hear it, it's, it's unmistakable. It's so unmistakable that it creates within you and within me a determined passion, a happy passion, a happy, determined passion to carry out what it is that we believed we heard. Some of us in the room, when we trusted Christ, it was a calling. We heard it in a crowd. We heard about Jesus Christ, perhaps. 
And suddenly we felt that tug within our own heart. It was a calling, it was a word from God, and we had a happy determination to put our trust in Christ. The same thing can happen in leaving a sin, in pursuing something that's obedient, in sharing the gospel with someone, serving in some way. There's this thing called a calling. And I believe that God wants in this crowd to speak to each one of us in a particular way. So let's ask that he would, okay? Father in heaven, would you please call each one of us? Just speak to us. Holy Spirit, would you remove the obstacles that would keep us from hearing what you are saying? Would you remove the unbelief that would keep us from believing that what you're saying could be a good thing? Would you help us, Lord, to be able to to create and develop within us this happy determination to do whatever it is that you would tell us to do. I need your help. We need your help in this. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, as I said many times in this study, the most telling thing about our future is what we think about Christ today. If we were to accurately pull from you what you believe about Jesus, when you think about Jesus, we could tell with tremendous amount of clarity, forecast some of your future decisions, the way that you would treat people. You see, just as God created each one of us with a genetic code, what that code basically is is something you can't see with the naked eye. You look at me, you don't see, you don't see this, but this is in me, and it's in you. And this code, it's a really interesting thing. It's sort of like a seed that you can't see. It's so small, and yet it's planted within us, and then it grows. And as it grows, it governs and determines our physical features, our blood type, our eye color, our bone structure, even some of our health risks in the future. There's a tremendous amount of governance over our physical being, the basis of seeds that you can't see. And in such the same way, our thoughts about Jesus Christ are seeds that people can't see. And yet they grow, and as they grow, they govern and determine our soul and all the behaviors and attitudes and motives and words that flow from our soul, which are visible to other people. Acts 17 says it this way, in him, that's Christ, in him we live and move and have our being, which means if we lose touch with the him, if we reject Christ outright, or even if we develop within ourselves an inaccurate picture of who he is, if we think wrongly about him, it so distorts our life, our decisions, and our personhood that it distorts everything about us until we begin to think rightly about him. There's many people in the world today who don't know who they are. And they're told it's one of the greatest lies that our culture has ever said, and that is you're going to find your identity in the mirror. Nobody finds their identity in the mirror. We only find our genuine, true identity when we look at Jesus Christ as he is, not the manufactured type that perhaps we've invented in our own mind in order to endorse our own desires, but the real Christ. When you see the real Christ and you're connected to him, suddenly your life, your behavior, your decisions, your movement, your personhood, your identity, it comes into focus. And this is why the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are just such gold, because they reveal the the true Jesus to us. Mark, the one that we're studying, begins with where he hopes we end. He begins with literally a summary statement of the entire book. It's chapter 1, verse 1, and he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What this means is that his hope is, starting in chapter 1, verse 2, he's going to lay out all the evidence that he knows to prove this declaration. His hope is that any reader that would read from chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to the end would say, do you know what I think about Jesus? He is the promised Christ. He's the Son of God. That's who he is. He's not a mere man, a mere teacher, a reformer, a religious historian. He is the Son of God. And we have seen in the first several chapters his authority over temptation, 
over confusion, over demons, over sickness, over leprosy, over forgiveness of sins. We've seen his authority over the Sabbath and its regulations, over religious people and irreligious people. And now we come to chapter three, verse seven, and there is a pivot. There are three pivots in the book of Mark. And this is the first one. Before the pivot, Jesus is spending all of his time in the crowds. He's healing massive amounts of people in crowds, individually, but in crowds. He's teaching enormous crowds. And there will continue to be crowds, but it's going to be different. So what happens in our text today is there is a summary of what he's done in his early stages of ministry. And then there is a transition to the selection and the training of 12 men who will take the news of what he's going to accomplish under their observation to the ends of the earth. So let's read it together. Verse seven, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, from beyond the Jordan, from around Tyre and Sidon. The great crowd heard all that he was doing. He came to him. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. He strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired and they came to him. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, friends, this is Jesus. This is one of the facets on this perfect diamond that is Jesus, the Son of God. And I want to encourage you to consider with me, not only this morning, but perhaps maybe even just plant these seeds in your heart. You can even consider them more yourself this week. Just a few truths that are born from what we just read. Before I even get into there, one thing I want to encourage you to consider is this, is that this experience week to week is going to be a whole lot better if you prepare yourself before you come. Now, some of you, this first time you're here, we're really glad you're here. But in the lobby, there's a little reading guide, and it looks just like this. And it identifies a number of passages through the week each day that supplement your understanding before we get to the passage that we'll look at on a Sunday. If you have a reading guide, I urge you to use it. But if you don't, I urge you to use this one. So what do we learn here about Jesus? First thing is that Jesus has authority, has the authority to attract the masses. Every one of us knows that if you find somebody in the world, and we do, we find people in the world who have such magnetism, there's something about them that has skill or something about them, some talent, some amazing skill, charisma to where people in all different camps want to be near or around that person. The rich, poor, white, brown, black, Jew, Gentile, men, women, young, old, it's like they're amazing. And each one of us are pretty familiar in life that when we see somebody that we admire, we like to talk about them. We're like, did you see what that person did on the golf course or on the football field or wherever it is? We love to point to people's attraction of how they attract so many people to what they're doing. That's the case. Just consider for a moment Jesus and his attraction of all of these people. One of the first things we recognize is that there's a problem. There's tension. And there's tension between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious elite in Israel. This, all this tension, it began. The fire sort of burst. The fury of the Pharisees lit when Jesus went into the temple. You can read this in John chapter two in Jerusalem. And he looked at all the corruption that was endorsed and authorized by the Pharisees, and he flipped the tables. 
Now, suddenly their fury was lit. And what you find is as we pick up in Mark, there's been a number of stories that we've seen where Jesus is fanning the flame. He's not doing so simply to ignite their fury. He's doing so is because there are people who are oppressed under their leadership, and he's trying to set people free. And so you find all of these stories, such as the when he claims authority as the son of man, as Daniel 7 promised, that he would have the authority to forgive sin. It was like the fire just grew. And it grew even more when he said, when we looked at, when he said, I have not come to patch up the tattered garment of Judaism, but I have come to replace it all together. And then that fire, it grew white hot when he claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath, healing people on the Sabbath, demonstrating his authority, and not following the regulations of what is permissible on the Sabbath that were instituted by the Pharisees. And when this took place, we're told in chapter 3, verse 6, which is the verse before our text, that the Pharisees went out and they began to plot his death. Well, Jesus knew that his hour had not come. He knew exactly when he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to die on the cross for our sin, when he was going to be buried in a grave and rise from dead. He knew when it was, and it wasn't now. And so notice what it says in chapter 3, verse 7, that Jesus withdrew with his disciples. He needed to take the boiling pot off the stove for just a little bit. And as he did so, there's a summary statement of his influence and popularity among the people within Israel. You notice it says that a great crowd followed him, and then he talks about all these places. Galilee is where they're at. It's sort of up in the north of Israel. Judea is in the south. Jerusalem is the capital city in Judea. Idumea is deep south, but it's the desert. And from beyond the Jordan, that's the east. Tyre and Sidon, that's the west, the northwest. Tyre and Sidon are roughly 100 miles Miles without a car to Galilee where Jesus is at. Tyre and Sidon are primarily Gentile provinces. Galilee is mixed between Jews and Gentiles. And Judea and Jerusalem are primarily Jewish populations. So what you find here is a testimony of the attraction of Jesus, that there was men and women who were Jews and Gentiles who traveled upwards of 100 miles in order to be near this man named Jesus. And we're told that Jesus healed individually. This is so important. If this room was all the people that he ever healed physically, he never just waved his hand over the room and everyone was healed. It was always individual. It was always he wanted to spend time with you, look you in the eye, touch you, touch your hand, talk to you personally, which created, because he only had one body, a bottleneck. You had masses of people all wanting to be near Jesus, who were desperate, who, were, who felt urgent, who were pleading, who, who, were, who were hurting, whose friends were laying them down in the hope that Jesus would walk close and they could reach up and simply touch him. They all wanted to touch Jesus. But what you find is urgent people become desperate people, and desperate people can become dangerous people. Desperate people can trample other people on the way to you. And so notice what it says in verse 9. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because the crowd, lest they crush him. And the reason is because he's healed so many people because they all want to touch him. But notice that sick people weren't the only desperate people in the crowd. Verse 11 says that whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And to them, he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, we've looked at this term, unclean spirits, when we were in chapter 1. We'll look at it again in chapter 5 and again in chapter 9, and here we find it once again. Unclean spirits is another term. It's a metaphor. No, no, no. no. It's a, um, what's the word? Um, It means demon, okay? And um, so demon, fallen angel, unclean spirit. And what you find is that these demons are, that they tempt They oppress, and when someone grows agreeable to evil without the Holy Spirit within them, demons can actually possess a person. And what's interesting is because they live in the spiritual world, they avoid detection. 
They love to live under a cover. We're told in 2 Corinthians that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And so I know in our day and age, in particular in the West, is that there's a lot of people who think that this is all myth. But the fact is, is the Bible represents a worldview, shows us a worldview, shows us a reality where there's two dimensions. There's a physical world that we live in where we see, touch, taste, and then there's a spiritual world. And the two overlap, and the two, one, and the conflict in the spiritual world that splashes up into the physical world. And so what you find is you have these unclean spirits who tempt us. If you've ever been tempted to sin against God, there was evil influence behind that. Some people, they get oppressed. The Apostle Paul says, he says that a messenger of Satan was sent to him to oppress him, and he says that it was like a thorn in his side. Three times he says, God, would you take it away from me? God says, no. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. There's oppression, but then there's some people, when they grow agreeable to evil, they can actually become possessed. This doesn't happen to people who have the Holy Spirit within them. So if you're born again, you can be tempted and you can be oppressed, but you cannot be possessed. These demons, though, they want to escape detection. They want to live in such a way that the world around sees their influence and blames everything except evil. So we blame a leader, and we blame a law, we blame a policy, we blame a school board, but we don't blame evil. And notice it says that when those who were inhabited by demons drew near to Jesus, they fell on the ground and the demons blew their cover. And they said, you're the son of God. When it says here that whenever the unclean spirits saw him, it's not like the unclean spirits got in the parade and walked to Galilee. He's saying that they were in the hearts of human beings, and those human beings were so desperate for freedom, so desperate to be set free, and they thought maybe Jesus can do it, is that they, even against the oppression within them, they walked to Galilee in order to be near Jesus in the hope that he could set them free. We saw the exact same thing in Mark chapter one when an individual who had been possessed by one of these demons, he thought maybe if I go to the synagogue today, maybe I'll be set free. And so he goes to the synagogue Jesus happens to be there that day and the demon blows his cover and he says have you come to destroy us before the time I know who you are you are the holy one of God and so consider what's happening here friends not only are sick people and whole people believers and unbelievers coming but among the masses of people who came to Jesus were people absolutely exhausted by the influence of evil within them looking for freedom and relief. And so, just as we love to talk about other popular people, let me urge us this morning to marvel at Jesus' power and his love to attract. Think about this, friends. Sick people came. Healthy people came. Jewish people came Gentile people came. Spiritually whole people came. Demon-possessed people came. Men and women from cities and villages a hundred miles away came to be near Jesus. His power and what that power could potentially represent in their own personal life, what they might be able to receive, drew all of those people to Jesus, and then his love kept them there. You see, it would be completely different if he had the power to draw all these people and then he was cruel once they arrived. But instead, Jesus, he absorbed just like a sponge with water all of their misery upon himself. They knew he cared for them. And there's a lot of people in this room right now, a crowd. We all came with stuff. And what I want you to know this morning, to remind you of this morning, is no matter why you came and what you came with, whatever burdens whatever oppression, whatever temptation, whatever sickness, whatever cancer, is that Jesus loves you. And he has the power to set you free. Another application that, frankly, really came to me during a time of confession this week is so one of the things I always do. I always take the text after I've written a sermon, and I go through it, and I'm like, is there anything in here that doesn't look like me? And one of the things that I had to confess as a believer in Jesus Christ 
is that I imagine that I live in such a way that if all of these people came and were around me, is that they, weren't near, they would not be nearly as comfortable as they were around him. Maybe that's something for us to consider as followers of Jesus, is with the masses from all of those different groups, will they all feel comfortable with you? Is there any group that if they got around you or a person from that group, that they wouldn't feel welcome or loved? The second thing I want you to see about Jesus is that he has the authority to call it and give us a name. Oh, this is so good. This is such an amazing thing, what he does here. I know for some of us, we look at the listing of the 12, and we think, oh, this is kind of like one of those yawner texts. Like, let's get back to the good part of the story. But friends, this is absolutely amazing what takes place. I want you to think about the mercy of Jesus and the strength of Jesus. He's literally spent an entire day with tons of sick people, demon-possessed people, caring for people, giving himself out, pouring his own life out. And Luke's gospel says before he called these, he went and he spent all night long praying to the Father for understanding as to who to select. Now think about giving your entire day to pouring yourself out, all your strength, and you spend all night long praying for the 12 that you're gonna select and then train. So he prayed all night, and then it says in verse 13, and he went up on a mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Did you notice he called them? It was a word they heard from God among those in a crowd. It created a passion and a determination to follow. You look through the scriptures, and you're gonna find four different lists of these apostles. You find them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. John didn't get the memo. You should write those in there. John was a disciple, and so he clearly knew who his buddies were. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, where you list all 12. And what you're gonna find is if you actually compared all of them is you're gonna find differences. Not many, but there's a few people whose names change. And you're like, what's that about? So let's go through each, and maybe I can explain it to you. First of all, we find Simon, Peter. Simon was the name his mom gave him. And Jesus looked at him and he says, yeah, I'm gonna make you into a rock of a man. Peter means rock, so I'm gonna go ahead and call you what I'm gonna make you. Peter was impulsive, he was proud, he was argumentative. He, he, was, um, he was a measure once, cut twice kind of man. He uh, made a lot of mistakes in his life, and, and, um, but God called him. It's interesting that in the other list that actually starts and it says, and first was Peter. And first there, they use the term first, not as the first one I want to give you, but first in terms of priority of authority. In other words, he was the leader of the 12, which is why when you get to the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit comes down upon them, someone asks questions. A lot of people ask questions. What do, what's going on? Someone had to speak on behalf of all of them and there was a leader among them, the first among equals, and it was Peter. Jesus made him into an amazing man. And then there was James and John. They were brothers, sons of Zebedee. You remember in Mark 1, they're out fishing. Jesus said, come follow me, and they leave their dad in the boat. And Jesus named them sons of thunder. We're not exactly certain why, but a lot of people think they know why. And there's a story in Luke chapter 9, which it's not funny, but it kind of sounds funny when you tell it. Jesus and his disciples went into a town, and the people didn't treat him very well. They, unbelieving, they kind of ran him out. And James and John look at Jesus and said, Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and just scorch him? And Jesus was like, easy thunder. Like, no, we're evangelists, not terrorists. Let's not burn them. Let's tell them good news. If they don't like it, we can go tell other people good news. James became the first apostle who was martyred. And John was the only apostle not martyred. John wrote five books in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. There's three different James that you're gonna keep, like James was a very popular name, and so sometimes people get confused as to who's which one. This James was the brother of John who was martyred. There's another James that we're gonna read about it in just a moment. And then there was another James who was the brother of Jesus who wrote the letter at the end or near the end of the New Testament called James. Then we get Andrew. 
Andrew was the brother of Peter. By the way, the further down the list you go, the less we know about them, okay? Andrew, we don't know a whole lot other than he was his brother. He was an important man, and he kept bringing people to Jesus, and that brings us to Philip. Philip, if any of you have a calculator on your person right now, like you and Philip would, like, buddies, you know? He's the spreadsheet guy. Um, they're like, Jesus, how are we going to feed all these people? And he's like, well, hold on. Let, let, me, let me figure it out. Let me see if nah, it's just not going to work, you know? He's, he was very intelligent, and yet one of the things you know about him and find about him is that he kept bringing people to Jesus. He was an evangelist at heart. That brings us to Bartholomew, which is actually probably not his name. Bar means son. He was the th- son of Tholomew. Other lists, as I said, there's four lists. Other call him Nathaniel, same guy. Nathaniel was the son of Tholomew. So they were interchangeable. Same guy, though. You, you remember Nathaniel when he's told, um, uh, hey, we've found the Christ. He's from Nazareth. You remember what he said? Can anything good come from that dumpster? You know, like that's just, there's no way. He was an arrogant, intellectual man from Judea, from the city. Nazareth was very country. Could anything good come from the farm is what he said. Just the son of God. Then came Matthew. We looked at his calling. His his other name is Levi a tax collector. And then there was Thomas. Have you ever heard of the name Doubting Thomas? It was from this guy. He, he wasn't around the first time Jesus revealed himself after he rose from the dead to his disciples. They say, go ahead and touch. And so they said, Thomas, man, you totally missed it. He, like, we, we, we saw him. He's, he's alive. He rose from the dead. And he says, I'm not going to believe until I get to touch myself. That's Thomas. And then we get to James, the son of Alphaeus. Let me tell you everything we know about James. He was the son of Alphaeus. And then we get to Thaddeus. And Thaddeus is an interesting guy because the, because the other list actually don't call him Thaddeus. They call him Judas, son of James. Now you remember, Judas was a very popular name. And then there was a Judas who did a really nasty thing, became totally notorious. And everybody's like, I want to change my name. If I'm a Judas, I don't want to be Judas anymore. So they went back to what his mom probably called him, which was Thaddeus theologians, uh, Bible students, scholars look at Thaddeus. It means um, like tender love child. Literally, it means like mama's boy. Um, it's a, it was, we don't even know if it was a real name or if it was a nickname, but it's like, let's go with that instead of Judas. Simon the Zealot. The only thing we know about Simon is he was a zealot. That doesn't mean he just had zeal. He had zeal for the Jewish nations to the place that he joined a party that planned clandestine attacks on Roman soldiers and Roman sympathizers. He was a terrorist until Jesus transformed his heart. And then there's Judas who betrayed him. Why 12? Because Jesus was creating a new Israel under a new covenant of grace. And you notice that it says that he appointed 12. He appointed 12. And the word appointed comes from the word poieo. This is gonna be, this is gonna matter so much here in just about two minutes. It means to make or create by determination. In other words, Jesus didn't look in the crowd and said, these are the 12 who have what it takes. No, he said, these are the 12 who I'm going to give what it takes. I'm going to create in them what it takes. And he began with new names. You notice in verse 14 through 17, to all of them he gave the name apostle, which means sent one. But then twice we see for Peter and James and John, he renamed them. He gave them names that indicated things. And names were really important in the ancient world. I suppose they still are. Even today, we care about our names. But names in particular in that time that conveyed essence of who we were and what we did. A lot of people, they wrestle over naming their children. We want to have the right name for our children. Names oftentimes are forms that we identify people. And in some cultures, you go around the world and people would identify their children on the basis of their family. So for example, Johnson or Anderson is the son of John or the son of Ander. In Icelandic nations, even today, you find at the end of some of the last names, instead of S-O-N, you find daughter, D-O-T-T-I-R. John 
daughter, which means daughter of John. Identification around family. Sometimes names were used and given to people as an identification of the family trade. And so there's Baker and Fisher and Smith. Parents today, we like to identify a name, the right name for our child. Isn't it interesting? There is a, there is a little point in me. I, I know it's real. There's a point in me. I think we're getting punked, though, because every single one of us has a name of nobility. Like, no one's named, like, son of disaster or, or something like this, right? We're like, hey, we named our child this. You know why? Oh, because it means strong one or it means God is bestowed beauty. It's a really fascinating thing. I know that there's some validity to all of that. It just happens that we only name, seems, people really amazing things. And because of that, it reveals to us that we have a lack of authority in our naming. We can name somebody a name, but we lack the authority to make them what that name means. In other words, kids often fail to live up to the noble meaning that their parents have given them in a name. Some of us, in our name is the word strong, and we can be weak. Because our parents can name us, but they don't have the authority to make us strong. Many of us, perhaps, I don't know, maybe you have a boat, or maybe you have a mountain house. For whatever reason, we like to name those things. You go up to the mountains, and everybody's named their house. It's like, oh, this is Happy Hollow, where we go to fight, right? (laughs) Because we go, we can name it, we have the authority to name it, we don't have the authority to actually create a culture that equals the name. But God, however, has authority. Let me say it this way. We all name to describe something, and God names to determine something an enormous difference there. Jesus looked at Simon and said, I am going to make you into a rock of a man, so I'm going to go ahead and call you what I'm going to make you. I'm determined that you will be a rock. So let me encourage us. Two applications on the second point. Let's take comfort that Jesus chooses the ordinary. When we think of the apostles, we see their faces carved in cathedrals and put in stained glass. We're like, man, these guys must be like barely, like just under divine furthest thing from the truth we're also used to these movies you know where like an asteroid is going to blow up the earth and so we have to build a build a a, like a like a like an ark some spaceship and let's find 2,000 of the best and brightest the strongest people the most beautiful people and we'll send them up to reestablish a new colony so that human life can can exist and so some people think man Jesus he's like creating a new Israel like all right I need 12 of the this is the strongest guys the best guys and what you find is that he called and when he called them none of them were renowned for theology oration maturity or virtue they were renowned for bad attitudes lapses of faith and arrogance just like us what does it prove it proves the power is in God and not in us Paul says, consider your calling. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong so that no human being might boast in the presence of God, which means that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can know for certain this, that he didn't choose you and me to raise the moral average of heaven. He chose us to show the world Only the grace of God can pull this off. Only his power, only his love can do this. And so it should create within us a humility. The second application is let's consider that Jesus gives us new names. You know, Jesus created the 12, right? He appointed the 12. Well, the New Testament goes on to say that he created us, a church, and he calls us something pretty unique in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Let me show that. We've already seen he appointed the 12, and appointed comes from poyeo, to create or make by determination. But then he says we are his workmanship. And this word workmanship, check this out. Poema. In English, we just say poem. We are his artistic expression. But what's interesting is the same root, it's Poieo, but with a suffix M-A. And the suffix in Greek M-A always means result of. In other words, the church is the result of God creating by his determination. That's who we are. 
He's appointed us as his children. He has created a church as a poem, as an artistic expression to say, look what I can create out of such diversity. And then he calls us what he's making us. And so he gives us new names. He says, you're a conqueror. You're the light of the world. You're a friend of God. You're the heir of God. You're righteous. You're like, I'm not righteous. He says you're righteous. You're righteous. You're the salt of the earth. And third, Jesus has the authority to commission those he calls. The apostles were told were authorized to do what the demons were forbidden to do, and that was to preach, to be his spokesperson. Verse 14, he says, he appointed the 12 so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And so they were to be with him. They were to watch him. They were to emulate him. They were to love him. They were to observe his relationship with God the Father as well as with other people. But then they were also sent to preach with authority and with a kind of authority that would be verified by their authority over evil. These disciples would witness the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts 2, they would be filled with the Holy Spirit And they would begin to write the New Testament by their own pen or by a friend who would write on their behalf. And then they went and they preached the gospel to the ends of the earth. Nearly all of them, except for one, would be martyred for their unwavering commitment to preach that Jesus rose from the dead. And it's interesting, we today, even at Providence, we stand on their shoulders. Ephesians 2 says, you are members of the household of God, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And so Christ, by his life, his death, and his resurrection, is the cornerstone. Upon that stone was laid 12 other stones. And upon those 12 other stones, the church was laid, and the church passed generation, generation to generation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, all the way down to us. What do we do with it? Well, let's be faithful to Jesus' commission. The calling to be with Jesus, to have a relationship with him, and to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth has now fallen upon us. He looks at us, the church, and he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Don't you understand a call is a word from God that produces a determined passion. So for those of us who understand that this is for us, it creates a happy determination to go and be the light of the world. He's named us the light of the world, and now it's time to be the light of the world. And we do this by praying for people and sharing to people, with people and inviting people here, but we also do it by serving people. This next Saturday, City Serve. If you're new around here, we do this twice a year, fall and spring, where we organize a number, and when I mean a number, like a bunch of service projects throughout our city. We gather here at 8 o'clock, eat a donut, pray, and we scatter in groups and teams. Hundreds of people will do this this Saturday. We would love for you to join us, and you can sign up for that here. Let me close, though, with a simple appeal, in particular to those who have never trusted Christ. I know when you come in here, perhaps you brought something that was really, really heavy, and you simply imagine, man, before I can come, I need to clean myself up. Jesus welcomes you as you are because you can't clean yourself up. I couldn't clean myself up. And so what he did was he did the work on our behalf. He came to the earth, he lived without sin, and yet he went to a cross and he died for ours and yours. He was buried because that's what you do with someone who is dead. And then he rose from the dead. Newness of life. And he comes to us and he, with a simple invitation. He says, if you'll admit that you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, you'll believe in me my life, death, and resurrection. If you confess me, Lord, of your life, surrender your life to me, I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you. I'll give you my righteousness. I'll give you a new name. I'll give you a new identity. And I'll give you a new mission that's worth your life. And so I urge you today, would you consider today putting your trust in Christ? So let's pray. Father in heaven, as we bow before you, I pray for those who are considering that appeal, that you would draw them to yourself. Your word says that you will save everyone who calls upon you. And so would you lead those right now to call upon you, to admit, to believe, and to confess. I pray, Father, for those who need a reminder of their identity, that you would remind them of their new names. 
Would you remind them that even though we like to name things, that we name things to describe things, but you name things to determine things. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us to grow confident as we connect to you. And Father, I pray for those of us who have trusted you that you would give us the ability now to invest some energy and to expend that energy in singing to you as an expression that we believe that you are the only one who has the power to make a way to set us free. And so we sing to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing together.
out of faith even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never oh, stop because we would know you his character we can sing even when i don't see it you're working he's faithful Providence family, Jesus is calling you to him, and he has made a way for us to come. Through his life and his death and his resurrection, we can have forgiveness of sin. We can be reconciled back to our creator, God. We can find peace. We can find rest. If you are here this morning and you have never responded to Jesus calling you to him, we would love to talk with you about that. Answer your questions. Help pray with you. You can take that blue card that's on the seat in front of you and you can take that back to the welcome desk where there are people who would love to meet you and pray with you and begin that journey with you. Let me encourage you, don't leave here this morning if you have not responded to his calling. If you prefer a digital option, you can go to pray.org slash info. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the service, pray.org slash info is also the best way to access all of the opportunities that we have here at Providence. And there's just one quick one that I wanna to mention to you uh, before we head out this morning. You heard Brian talk about how next weekend we're gonna be doing city serve. We're gonna go out into the city and we're gonna be serving and we're gonna be blessing people. But what we wanna do is we wanna wrap up our weekend together next Sunday night at six o'clock right here with a prayer and worship night. It's gonna be a time for us to gather, to pray, to sing. Uh, we're gonna be praying about individual needs. We're gonna be praying about things that are happening in the world. Anything that the Lord has burdened your heart with, we can offer up to the Lord. If you have not been a part of one of our prayer and worship nights, they are really, really sweet. And so I wanna personally invite you to come uh, and join us for that next Sunday night. Well, it's been a really good morning together. And so as we prepare to head out, would you go to the Lord with me in prayer? Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. God, just for the wonderful opportunity that it's been to be able to come here to gather together as a community, sing praises to your name and to open up your word. And God, I pray that the truth of your word will continue to pierce our hearts and to challenge us this week. God, I pray that you would help us to remember that you are drawing us to you. You have called us. God, your desire is to know us and to be with us and to walk alongside of us. And you provide everything that we need and the strength to go about our days. And so God, we do pray for that strength right now. Guide us and direct us this week. Be with us next weekend as we head out into the city to serve and to bless, to be light in the midst of darkness. God, we pray that you would use that and that the impact would be exponential. So God, we love you. We submit ourselves to you. We pray all of these things 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Providence. Have a great week.